I want to first of all thank you all. I'm very glad to be here. I'm excited for this year's RIA, who has to be virtual. But we're excited. We have more attendees than ever. And, and it's been growing every year. So thank you all, all the attendees for being here. I hope this is good and helpful overall, and this, this course in particular too. It's my pleasure to introduce Victor Zavala, who I didn't have the pleasure of meeting yet. He's the... Hello? Can you hear me? We can hear you. I think that Andres is yeah. the one who is unstable. Yeah, I think that Andres' connection is the one that is unstable. Yeah. Hi, Andres. Um, Maybe you I turn off your camera for a second just to stabilize the Wi-Fi, maybe that will help you. Okay, sorry for that. Can you hear me right now? Yes. Okay, I was introducing you, Victor. So yes. the Valdovin, the pra Associate Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a computational mathematician in the Mathematics and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Laboratory. He also he holds a bachelor degree from Universidad Iberoamericana and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, both in chemical engineering. He's on the, on, on the editorial board of the Journal of Process Control, Mathematical Programming Computation, and IEEE Transactions on Control Systems and Technology. He's a recipient of the National Science Foundation and DOE Early Career Awards and of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. His researchers his research interests include computational modeling, statistics, control, and optimization. So it's a pleasure to have you, Victor. I will, for all the attendees, I will share a form right now. If you could fill it, just to have some information about who you are, I would appreciate that you can do that during the talk. So welcome, Victor, and the floor is yours. Sounds great. Thank you, Andres, for, first of all, for organizing very interesting event. a lot of very interesting talks uh, in the event. So I invite everyone to uh, try to join as much as you can of uh, this uh, summer school. Um, so it's a pleasure to be giving this short introduction to mathematical principles of machine learning. So um, this is intended to be really an introduction, like an overview of different areas of mathematics that, that have to come together to, um, to solve complex problems that arise nowadays in artificial intelligence and machine learning. It is by no means intended to be an in-depth discussion. So the, the structure of the, of the course is, uh, is uh, uh, this. So uh, we're gonna spend half an hour talking about optimization and statistical estimation. We're gonna talk a little bit about linear algebra um, that's a very important tool for uh, machine learning applications. Also convolutions and Fourier analysis that arise quite a bit in, in computer vision. And ultimately we're gonna bring all these concepts together into machine learning tools. So some of you might have already heard about things like classification, Kriging, uh, Bayesian optimization and neural nets. But again, the, the idea here is going to be the, uh, to try to bring all of this um, in a, in a very introductory fashion. And then what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna share with you the link of this website that you're seeing. I'm gonna put it in the chat box. And if you go to that link, you're gonna be able to access um, the, the, all the slides that I'm presenting. So if you wanna take notes or something, uh, just go ahead and download the slides. Um, also some of the examples that I'm gonna show you that unfortunately we won't have enough time to go but some of the examples, um, I'm gonna cover um, uh, Mat MATLAB examples that are basically easy to follow. I decided to use MATLAB because a kind of a language that everyone understands with very low level. It's not obviously as good as Python and other tools like Julia, right? But uh, it is the, uh, a good tool for everyone to share, okay? So, um, so okay, so I want these uh, two hours to be a little bit interactive. Um, so maybe a one first thing is that if you can uh, let me know in the chat box, where are you coming from? Like where, where are your, um, what is your affiliation and what is your background? So tell me which university are you coming from? And also what is your background? Are you an engineer? Are you a mathematician, a statistician? Just, just let me know what's your background and that will also help me, okay? So without further ado, let me get started with the introduction of this, okay? Um, 
All right. So, okay, so let's get started. So we're gonna start discussing a very important part of mathematics, which is optimization and estimation uh, are very important tools that are used in machine learning. Um, so, but before getting started with that, I just wanna motivate the, the need for machine learning, right? So uh, probably some of you are already familiar with some of these things, so I'm just gonna go super quick. Um, so these areas of data science and machine learning are exploding very quickly in the recent years. Um, these tools are gonna allow you to do many different things. So you can do things like data analysis, right? So if you're giving a very complex data set, you can try to reduce it, to visualize it. You can do analysis of time series, clustering, computer vision. So just trying to make sense of high dimensional data in general, right? Uh, the tools can allow you to also to build predictive models, right? So this is techniques like neural nets, screening, classification, where the idea is that you wanna take a set of input features of data and try to make a prediction of a given uh, label, for example. Um, these tools are also getting uh, quite a bit of traction in, in an area called artificial intelligence that is closely connected with control, feedback control where here the idea is that you wanna automate decision-making by using data, building models and making decisions. And we're gonna cover some of that in uh, topics uh, soon, all right? Now, the interesting thing about these machine learning and data science tools is that they actually combine different mathematical principles from very different areas of mathematics. And this is why they have been so powerful, right? They are bringing together many different things that are making this successful. Uh, one of them is statistics, right? So I think many of them have roots in statistics and trying to characterize uncertainty, try to characterize uh, uh, random phenomena. But there are other areas of mathematics that are coming in here. One of them is optimization, linear algebra, and geometry and topology. So those, those are another uh, set of mathematical um, principles that come into play in these types of tools, all right? So, Ultimately, at the, at the core of all of this is gonna be data, right? Data is, we always start with data. And then the idea is that we're gonna go from data to constructing models and finally making decisions, right? So that's typically the type of this uh, uh, workflow that you're gonna follow. I start with some complex data, I wanna make sense of it, I wanna understand how can I correlate this to an output of interest. That establishes a model. Once I have a model, then I can start finding the optimal way of running a system, for example, right? So this is uh, uh, at the core of all of this is, is really uh, data. One important thing that I always tell my students in, in uh, when I'm teaching this type of courses is that um, data typically, when it comes to us, it can be in raw form, in a form that really doesn't tell us much about the system of interest, right? So it is our job to apply tools to actually extract meaningful information or what we call knowledge from that data, okay? Typically that knowledge comes in the form of a model, right? So the model, you can think about it as a repository for that, that knowledge, right? So I like to give the example of um, a physical model like Newton's law. So Newton's law is a, is a model that relates inputs, input variables to output variables, right? Like forces, acceleration, things like this, right? And, and this tells you how these different variables are related. And you can think about this as a repository for a lot of different data that has been collected in the past and to establish relationships between uh, those variables, okay? Very good. All right. So I'm gonna skip uh, some slides just in the interest of time, okay? But maybe I just wanna mention this. Um, one of the fundamental aspects of what machine learning is trying to do is to some extent try to mimic the way that the human brain works, right? It is trying to uh, develop tools that, for example, help you learn from data. Now, when we say learning, in most cases, we actually mean constructing a model. So how is it that our brain establishes relationships between variables inside our, right? Inside, automatically inside of our brain, just based on observations. The other thing that these types of tools are trying to do is to make sense of the world and establish these relationships based on data that is collected from all our sensory systems, 
And this is interesting because the human body is exposed to many different sources of data, right? So you have vision, you have your hearing, right? You have your uh, tasting, right, smell. So those are very different types of data, right? That comes from chemical signals, auditory signals, visual signals, and they're very complex and sophisticated ways go, uh, that are happening inside our brain, right? That is trying to uh, extract information from data. And those are the types of things that we're trying to mimic with these uh, machine learning tools. Sometimes this uh, mimicking is not perfect, right? It's not that we are exactly doing what the brain does, but I think it's a, a good um, a motivation for the types of tools that we're trying to develop. I think it's important to understand that we as humans actually have already very powerful tools. So why try to reinvent the wheel, right? If we can actually try to mimic what nature has uh, given us, right? Okay, so let's get started with very quickly with some discussion. The first topic that I wanna touch on is on estimation. So the first thing that we wanna do is to take a set of input variables that I'm gonna call X, and I have a set of variables um, Xi, so from I equals to one to N. So think about these are input variables that you're trying to, that you have accessible to you, right? Machine learning people call these features as well. And then you wanna construct a model that will allow you to predict a given output of interest, right? And I'm gonna express this output as Y. Now, what allows you to establish the relationships within the inputs and the outputs is the model. And in this case, we're gonna assume a very simple model. It's a linear model that is gonna capture the relationship between inputs and outputs through parameters, okay? Now, the idea here is that we're gonna to try to identify parameters that best map the inputs to the outputs in the sense that they match observations that we have available to us, right? So you collect observations from a given system and you're trying to find those parameters that best uh, fit the outputs, right? To the, the model outputs, to the real outputs, okay? But the problem is not that easy, right? One of the issues that arise in many applications is that typically you have random phenomena that is contaminating your outputs. These are things that we cannot explain, right? Things that they're just random fluctuations. So think about weather or any source of randomness that appears in your system. And this is important because uh, in statistics, we have tools that allow you to characterize uh, this type of uh, randomness, right? But this is really what is contaminating or uh, preventing us from actually making perfect predictions, all right? Besides the fact that maybe this linear model that we have is not truly uh, a, a, a faithful representation of the world, right? Maybe the world is actually non-linear and we're trying to represent with a linear model, right? But even if we assume that we have a linear model, this randomness will actually affect you, okay? And we're gonna look into techniques for actually taking that randomness into account, all right? Okay, so the idea here is precisely, we're gonna take a bunch of observations that I just gonna label as omega. These are just the set of observations that I have available. And I just want to make predictions uh, using my model and estimate the parameters of interest, right? I can compactly express these uh, model predictions by using matrix notation. So some of you probably already have background in linear algebra based on the background that I'm seeing here. So I just can com compactly express these inputs and the outputs in this form. This vector contains all the observations for the output this matrix X is very important because it contains all the information for your inputs. This vector contains all the parameters and this vector here contains all the randomness, all the random effects that we cannot uh, capture with the model, right? Now, one thing that we typically don't talk about much in machine learning, but I think it's very important to go back to the beginnings is precisely this noise. This noise uh, can prevent us from actually making perfect predictions of the world, right? So it is important that we construct a characterization of these random phenomena. And this is, uh, in the statistics, you use techniques, very simple ones, right? You could say, for example, that this uh, noise is Gaussian, it's a normal distribution. I'm gonna assume that it has a zero mean and that it has a certain covariance matrix. You do not have to worry about the details of all of this at this point, but I just wanna give you an idea, right? That it is important that we characterize that randomness in some form. Okay, and this is the most standard approach for doing. 
Okay, so once we have built our model, um, turns out that we can actually show that because we have this randomness effect here, right? The outputs that we actually get out of our model are actually random variables, okay? That are centered around my model prediction. So this is my model prediction. And that have a certain degree of uncertainty. And this uncertainty is characterized by this covariance matrix. But it is very important that we realize that these outputs that we're obtaining out of the system are actually random variables, okay? Now, if they are random variables, that means that they have a distribution, right? And in this case, this distribution is captured by this density function. Do not worry about the details at this point. Just, if this is really an introduction, very simple, okay? I just wanna kind of connect the ideas without necessarily going into the details, okay? But this uh, probability density function is really what characterizes how these uh, outputs are, are moving and they're random, okay? Now, in order for us to find the parameters that best explain the observation, one of the techniques that is used in statistics is called maximum likelihood estimation. Very powerful technique. The idea here is that what this technique tells you is, I'm going to maximize this density function with respect to the parameters of interest, okay? And at this point, just worry about the parameters theta because I don't have time to explain the other one, okay? So let's just focus on the parameters theta. And you can actually show that this, this way of estimating parameters is actually really, really powerful, right? It has statistical uh, principles, right? And there's a reason why people estimate parameters in this way. And this is probably the most widely used approach for doing it, okay? Now, an interesting trick that you're gonna find in optimization is that maximizing a function is usually equivalent to maximize the logarithm of that function, okay? So typically what you do is maximize the logarithm of this function. And in this particular case, what you can show is that this joint density actually becomes an interesting term that looks like this form. And at this point, it might look a little bit scary, this term. I'm gonna show you that this is nothing but the sum of square errors between the model and the, and the data, okay? So, but for now, do not worry too much about it, okay? But we have a, a problem that, that we want to solve in order to estimate those parameters of interest. And I'll go into these details a little bit, right? Now, this is a, a diagram that I'm always showing my students. The fundamental task that estimation is gonna give you is that you want to extract as much more knowledge as possible from your data. Anything that cannot be explained from your model, any source of randomness is precisely what we don't know. And this is very important because in most applications, when we are presented with data, there are gonna be some aspect of the data that we can actually explain. And there's some aspect of the data that our model can explain, right? And some aspect of the data that we simply cannot explain because it's due to pure random phenomena, okay? So that's just kind of a, an important thing. Okay, so let's examine, the, uh, examine this um, uh, optimization problem that I showed you before a little bit, okay? So what I'm going to do first is I'm gonna replace the maximum with a minimum. And the way that I can do that is just by simply multiplying the objective function by a minus one, right? And that's very simple. And if I do that, I obtain this very ugly term that is here, okay? Now we are solving this problem by trying to minimize this function with respect to theta. And what you observe here is that this parameter, uh, actually this term over here does not depend on theta. So that means that I can just cancel it out, right? And if I cancel it out, then I'm given this optimization problem that is much simpler to interpret, okay? This is what people call in statistics a least squares problem. What this problem is trying to do is to minimize the difference between the, the model 
and the data. Okay. And this matrix that appears here is the covariance matrix of your nodes. And I'm gonna explain in a second why this becomes important, right? This is acting as a weighting matrix of the different entries. So at this point, do not worry too much, but it's an interesting thing. But this is the optimization problem that we need to solve if we want to estimate our parameters of interest. So let's make further simplifications. If I assume that this matrix here is actually a diagonal matrix, right? So this is a matrix that will look something like this, sigma one, sigma and square. What you can actually show, and I'm not gonna do it because I don't have time, is that the optimization problem that I just showed you before will reduce into this form. And now look that I have a summation here over all my observations, this is the discrepancy between my data and my model for a given observation omega, right? And you see that I'm minimizing the square discrepancy. So that's why people call it the least squares. But there's an interesting insight that appears here. Notice how now the variances of my noise appear here, okay? So that means that this matrix sigma is telling us something about how we should be weighting the observations. So when this sigma value is very small, that is telling me that I should put a lot of emphasis on that observation. Why? Because if the variance of my observation is small, that means that I can trust it, okay? So I put a lot of weight to it. If the variance is large, right? If this thing is large, that means that this term is actually very small and it is telling me, you know what? Do not pay too much attention to that observation because um, it has a lot of uncertainty. So I'm not sure if you should trust it that much, okay? So this is the interesting interpretation of the, about this uh, noise variance that we have here. It is implicitly telling you which observations you should trust and which observations you should not trust, okay? That is a very important kind of principle here. By the way, at this point, I wanna tell you, I'm gonna be stopping every 30 minutes so that you ask questions, okay? So we're gonna be uh, stopping um, uh, on a frequent basis. All right, I can make further simplifications and I can, for example, assume, you know what? I can trust all these observations equally. I don't trust one more over the other ones. I'm just gonna assume that all of them are constant, con constant, okay? So in that case, you can actually show that the optimization problem reduces to this very simple form, okay? So there are different ways to formulate this estimation problem depending on the assumptions that you're making about your data, right? If you trust the data equally for every observation, then you solve this problem. If you do not trust it equally, then you do that. If you don't want to assume that the covariance is diagonal, then you solve the more general one, right? So there's kind of a hierarchy of different formulations that you can deal with. All right. Now, I just want to revisit some basic concepts on optimization that I think are essential for understanding the solution of this optimization problem, okay? So ultimately what I want is to try to minimize a problem. I'm going to try to solve a problem that tells me I want to minimize this sum of square errors that depends on theta. This sum of square errors, I'm going to assume that has this simple form that I just showed you before. I can show that this form can actually be expressed mathematically in this form. Do not worry too much about the details. I just want you to remember that this is equal to that and this is equal to that. Mathematicians like to express this problem in different ways. Some of them like prefer to express it in very compact ways, okay? But this is the optimization problem that I need to solve, okay? And if I could plot this in one dimension, right? In mind that I have my parameters theta and I have my sum of squared errors. This is a quadratic function, right? Because of this term over here. So I can actually guarantee that this objective function actually looks like a quadratic type of function, all right? 
Now, I want to identify the value of these parameters that give me the minimum point, okay? Now, can some of you remember from calculus, how do I find the minimum of a function? Can you remind me? I just wanna make sure that everyone is awake. You can unmute yourself so you can put it in the chat as you guys prefer. Can anyone remind me, how do I find the minimum of a function from calculus? What do you think? Oh, good, do you remember? I can wait a little bit until you think about it. Excellent, oh, very good. Now I'm seeing a lot of things, excellent. Yeah, so the derivatives, right? So we need to look at the derivatives, right? Gerardo precisely says, I wanna make sure that the derivative is zero, okay? And that's precisely what we do. So remember that in one dimension, the way that I identify the minimum is precisely when the tangent has a zero slope, right? If I draw a tangent here, this does not have a zero slope, so that is not a minimum, right? So I need to ensure that this tangent is precisely equal to zero. Now, in multiple dimensions, because I have multiple parameters, not only one parameter, the generalization of that result is this. I want that the gradient of the function is equal to zero. That gradient is nothing but the partial derivative with respect to each one of those parameters. And I need to guarantee that all of those are equal to zero. So in every direction for every parameter, I need to ensure that I have zero slope, okay? That's how you find this. So it turns out that because this is a linear model, it's super easy to find the minimum of that, right? The solution of that problem. Turns out that the derivative is given by this quantity over here, okay? And I can do very simple algebraic man manipulations to find the solution theta for this, okay? So I need to guarantee that this thing is equal to zero. So what I can do is to take x transpose y minus x transpose x theta equal to zero. <clears throat> I can move this to the right, right? And then I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take this guy to the right. And then that is gonna give me x transpose x theta is equal to minus x transpose y. <clears throat> then I can multiply this, right? But um, I'm sorry, I have a minus here. Can multiply both sides by minus. So this becomes that. And then I'm gonna take this matrix, right? And I'm gonna invert it and put it on the other side, right? And that is gonna give me theta is equal to x transpose x minus one x transpose y. And that is precisely what you saw here. So in this particular case, this optimization problem that we need to solve has an explicit solution. And you see that this explicit solution depends on your input data and on your output data as expected, right? And it has a very interesting form. I'm gonna show you later that when the optimization problem is nonlinear, when the model is actually nonlinear and not a nonlinear like right now, this solution does not have an explicit form, right? I cannot write this in that form anymore. That means that we need to resort to numerical techniques to solve that problem, okay? But that's a more difficult case, all right? Okay, so we have solved our first optimization problem, right? This is the solution of the problem. This is the best possible parameter that we can obtain based on the data that we have available. So you say, that's it, right? I'm done. Well, wait a second, right? So when you take the first derivative of a function, that only tells you that the function is at a point of zero slope, okay? And not only that, so I think that there are two complications here. The first complication is that in some cases, you're gonna have functions that look like that. That cannot happen in this case because we're looking at a linear problem, but in the nonlinear case, it can happen, all right? 
So that means that a maximum point and a minimum point satisfy the condition that the first derivative is zero, okay? But the problem is more complicated than that. Even in the ideal case where you have a function that looks like that, so that means that it cannot have a maximum, it only has a minimum. You are also interested in how sharp the minimum is. Not all minima are the same. And this is a very important concept in statistics, okay? Sometimes this function will look like this. Sometimes this function will look like this. This is what we call a flat surface. And a flat surface is actually very dangerous from a statistical standpoint. Why is that? If you think about it, when you have a flat surface like this, any of the values of the parameter theta give you exactly the same match of the data. It minimizes the, fun the sum of square errors, right? So that means that there's no unique minimum, right? There are actually multiple minima there, okay? So that is the worst thing that can happen to you. In machine learning, that appears quite a bit, especially in neural networks. There are multiple parameters can, that can explain the data. This is what gives rise to overfitting. And we're gonna look into that a little bit more, right? We cannot, we do not have enough data to actually say these, are, these parameters are unique. There, it might be possible that there are other parameters that give you exactly the same fit to the data, okay? So that's a very important concept in statistics. So how do you address this issue? So an important thing is to look not only at the first derivative, but you wanna look at the second derivative, okay? The second derivative is super important. In, the, in a multidimensional setting, the second derivative is given by this magical function uh, a magical matrix that people call the Hessian matrix. This is the Hessian of second derivatives. And this is nothing but the second derivative of my sum of square errors <clears throat> with respect to every combination of parameters, theta zero, theta zero, theta one, theta zero, okay? So very easy matrix, right? This matrix is an N by N matrix. It's on the dimension of the number of parameters, okay? In the linear case, I can actually show that if I take the derivative of this again with respect to theta, what I'm going to recover is x transpose x, okay? And this is what you see here. So it turns out that the Hessian for a linear model is actually very simple. It's an x transpose x. So that means that the Hessian only depends on your input matrix, okay? And this is a very important observation. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part, uh, this example in the, in the interest of time, but I invite you to check it out if you have time uh, after the course, okay? But I'm just gonna go into that. All right, this uh, Hessian matrix is gonna become super, super important. And I'm gonna go into those details a little bit uh, later, but I also want to explore a little bit more this matrix X transpose X because it turns out that this appears everywhere in statistics, right? The other observation that you can get from statistics is that the parameter that you estimate, and this is kind of a, a difficult concept for students to appreciate, right? But the, the optimal parameter that you get by solving the optimization problem is actually a function of your output observations, right? It is a function of this, okay? But these output observations are actually random observations, right? We saw that this is, we have randomness here. For example, if you go to a laboratory and you run the same experiment two times, I can guarantee to you that the output that you're gonna observe is gonna be different. It might be slightly different, right? It might be maybe not too, too far, but it's gonna be different by some probably small amount. Sometimes it's a big amount. So that means that even if I repeat the experiment multiple times, the same one, 
you're gonna have variability. Why is that important? Because if I collect data based on the observations that I have, I'm gonna get an estimate. But if I repeat the experiment again, I'm gonna get a different estimate, right? And if I repeat it again, I'm gonna get another estimate, right? So that means that every time that I collect data, I'm actually getting a different estimate, right? So there's some inherent randomness. What that means is that my estimate actually varies with the observation. It's a random variable, right? And this is a principle of statistics that is becoming more and more important in machine learning. Nowadays, people are very worried about the uncertainty of the parameters of your neural net, for example, right? So if these estimates vary, that means that they're uncertain, right? They're, you cannot fully tell me this is 10. It is, this is 10 plus minus some quantity, right? In order to establish that plus minus, you need to characterize the uncertainty of those parameters. And what is very interesting is that the uncertainty of those parameters involves this magic matrix here again. That is exactly my Hessian matrix. So you see that the Hessian matrix is appearing and appearing in different places. It appears from the fact that it is defining how well defined my minimum is, and it is also appearing from the perspective that it defines the uncertainty of the parameters, okay? How much I can trust those parameters. So it's kind of an interesting observation. All right, so I'm gonna skip that. Turns out that this matrix X transpose X also appears in another quantity that I don't have time to go into, but for some of you, you might have heard of this. There's something called um, the um, Fisher information matrix, okay? And you can actually show that this Fisher information is actually directly connected also with this matrix X transpose X, okay? And you can generalize this Fisher information to account for the general case when you have this um, um, uncertainty in your output noise. But in the simple case, it's actually X transpose X. So that means that this Hessian matrix keeps appearing over and over again. The Fisher information is something that tells me how much information I have in my data, as the name suggests, right? So the data that I have available to me, how much information does it carry, okay? So that means that the Hessian matrix is also connected to that. All right, so let me take a quick short break just to let you ask any questions, any clarification questions that you might have at any uh, at some uh, at this point. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Anything that you feel curious about? I just wanna make sure that I'm not going too fast or too slow. Um, so anything that you feel curious about, any concept, feel free to unmute yourselves or feel free to put it in the chat box. Don't be shy. It's not an exam, right? Any questions? In the meantime, I'm gonna read here. I have some people from Guanajuato, UW Madison, great. Andres, UW Madison, okay, good. Perfect. No questions? Okay, so let me continue. I'm gonna skip that part. So this is one of the most important questions that arise in uh, industry, right? And in experiments as well in academic research. So I want to estimate these parameters theta, right? To be able to build a model that allows me to make a prediction, right? And one of the questions that arise is, do I have enough data to estimate those parameters? Okay. And precisely what I wanna show you is that the Hessian matrix plays a fundamental role in answering that question, okay? So one of those questions is precisely this, right? I want to use the Hessian matrix to actually uh, answer that question, 
okay? And what I'm gonna see is that this Hessian matrix is gonna tell me something about how sharp my minimum is for my SSE function, how much information my data has, and also how much can I trust my parameters, okay? So it has three meanings, and this is really interesting, the connection of all of that, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip this part just for in the interest of, of this, right? Well, let me just discuss something. Um, the fundamental quantities that, that you use to characterize a matrix are the eigenvalues of the matrix, okay? So remember that this Hessian matrix is actually precisely a, a matrix. And if I wanna quantify how uh, big this matrix is or how small this matrix is, it doesn't make sense to ask that question for a matrix, right? Because a matrix is a complicated object. It doesn't make sense to say, is this matrix big or small, right? That doesn't make sense. However, we can make sense of that by looking into the eigenvalues of the Hessian, the eigenvalues of the matrix. The eigenvalues are the ones that tell us, tell us how big or small a matrix is. Okay, you can think about it that way. So the eigenvalues of this are gonna be precisely the things that are gonna allow me to quantify if this matrix contains a lot of data, uh, if it contains a lot of information, if it doesn't, all right? Okay, the first thing is the following. If you want to guarantee that your estimate is sitting at a minimum point, you need to ensure that all your eigenvalues are non-negative, okay? They can be zero or positive, but it, they cannot be negative. If you have an eigenvalue in your Hessian matrix that is negative, that is less than zero, you are in trouble, right? That means that you are sitting at a point that looks like this, as opposed to like this, all right? But we know that in the linear case, that cannot happen. In the nonlinear case will happen. I'll show you in a second, okay? All right. But that only tells me if I'm sitting at a minimum or not. I'm interested in quantifying if my surface looks flat or if it looks sharp, okay? How sharp or how flat it is, is given precisely by how large the parameters are, the eigenvalues. If the eigenvalues are large and, and positive, that means that this is sitting at a sharp minimum. So you're seeing something like this, okay? If one or more of the eigenvalues is close to zero, you're actually sitting at a surface that looks very flat. So that means that the dangerous thing, the worst thing that can happen to you is you are sitting at a minimum with a, with a Hessian matrix that has a zero eigenvalue. If that is the case, you are in trouble, right? That means that there can be multiple parameters that explain your data. And that happens in neural nets quite a bit, okay? So it's a very important observation, okay? Um, this also means not only that you're sitting at a minimum point, but it also means that your data does not have enough information. That's another way to think about it. My data does not have enough information to estimate those parameters uniquely. That's another way of thinking about it. The other way to think about it is that the parameters that I'm estimating have high variability. That means that I cannot trust them. You just cannot trust them, period. Okay? All right. If one of the parameters is exactly zero, that is the worst that can happen to you, right? So the parameters absolutely cannot be obtained uniquely, right? And that means that the, the surface is flat, uh, fully flat. And that means that your parameters actually have infinite variability. So they have infinite uncertainty. So it is very, very important that you always check uh, the eigenvalues of your, of your heads, okay? All right, I'm gonna skip this part just in the interest of time, but I invite you to check the, the slides. Okay, well, turns out that all these little concepts that we have been discussing, that we are discussing in very simple terms, right? 
apply to nonlinear models as well. Fundamentally, the same things apply, okay? In the nonlinear case, what we have is that we have a more general relationship between my inputs and my outputs. It is no longer linear, okay? But the same principles will apply of the things that I have been telling you about, okay? This is important because advanced machine learning models like neural nets can actually be expressed in this, in this form, right? So fundamentally, there's no difference. So many of the techniques that you find in statistics for estimating parameters are applicable to neural nets, okay? So that, that's an important thing that I just wanna highlight. All right, so why is it that the same principles apply, right? Well, it turns out that the optimization problem that you end up solving for estimating the parameters is basically the same problem. The only difference is that now you have a model here that is more complicated, is nonlinear. But if you look at the structure of this problem, it's exactly the same one, right? I'm just trying to minimize the discrepancy between my model and my data. That's all that I'm doing, okay? The, the other difference that you're gonna find is that when you're trying to find the solution of that optimization problem, this uh, first derivative is not, not anymore so easy to calculate and to solve, okay? I can no longer solve explicitly for theta in this case because this model can be very complicated, right? So that means that you need to resort to numerical techniques. And this is very important in neural nets, for example, right? You need to resort to numerical techniques to actually solve this problem. And there are many techniques that people have explored. We're gonna discuss that in a second. So for example, people have discussed Newton's method, gradient descent, different types of techniques, okay? The other thing is that the Hessian matrix now involves a very complicated, nonlinear expressions, it is not that easy to calculate the Hessian anymore, okay? And even if you can calculate it, the, the size of this matrix can be very large, right? Particularly in problems like the neural net, to the point that this matrix is very hard to store in memory, okay? So it is one of those complications that arise in, in complex nonlinear models, all right? But again, I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but I just wanna highlight some of the challenges that appear in the, in the nonlinear case, all right? So linear models are easy, nonlinear models require more advanced techniques. Nowadays, we have very advanced tools for doing these types of things, but I just wanna highlight some of the challenges uh, that appear. Okay. This is something that is not discussed too much in the machine learning community, but the same statistical principles apply, right? So if you're estimating your parameters based on random observations, right? That means your, your estimates are also random, right? So that means that they have a distribution and you can characterize the variability of these parameters. And turns out that you can actually quantify the variability of those parameters using the Hessian matrix as we did before, right? So again, the Hessian matrix appears here, right? Over and over again. Okay, so one of the take home messages that I want you to uh, just remember is that the Hessian matrix, the matrix of second derivatives is, is a fundamental quantity that you really wanna keep track of, okay? Especially even if you're doing neural nets, just always think about it, right? And, and we can discuss that in more, in more detail uh, in a second. Okay, so now let me plug my laptop before I go into this. And in the slides, you're gonna find all sorts of examples on how do you solve linear and nonlinear estimation problems. I prefer to put all the slides there for you in case that uh, you wanna study these topics in more detail because this is really just an introduction, right? but I invite you to just check all the uh, different topics that are uh, covered cover here. All right. Now, I wanna conclude this first hour by um, 
talking to you a little bit about prior knowledge. This is a really important topic that in machine learning now, now this is being discussed. When I am estimating parameters, um, I have my data available to tell me, right, what those parameters are gonna be. But sometimes the practitioner might actually have some idea on what are the actual values of those parameters. Might have some rough idea, right? Might say, you know what, those parameters cannot be greater than 1 million, it doesn't make sense. They cannot be negative, they can only be positive, right? So that is a way to think about knowledge that the practitioner might have, okay? So there are different ways of conveying prior knowledge to the optimization problem that we're solving, okay? And this is one of the things that I wanna discuss next that I think is a very important topic in statistics, right? So prior knowledge, what is the big deal with this? The first way that I like to think about this is constraints, okay? So this is the most natural way that practitioners have to think about prior knowledge. So is I'm gonna minimize this objective function. This is the same objective function that we minimized before. You can think about it that way. We have not changed anything, right? If you read the slides, you will see the details of why I'm calling it that instead of SSC, but it's the same function. But the practitioner might say, you know what, wait a second. If you're gonna try to minimize this function, like, you know what, do not even bother searching outside this range because I know that these parameters can actually cannot be, let's say below zero and above 100. And this is very important for numerical reasons because that prevents the solver from Newton's method, for example, from visiting regions that actually make no sense, right? So they're kind of narrowing down. The way that you convey that information is in the form of constraints, okay? And you can express these constraint, cons, uh, constraints in different ways, okay? Right. Another fundamental way that you have to convey this prior knowledge is in the form of what people call a penalty term. So the idea is that I can incorporate a penalty function that is actually preventing the optimization solver from visiting weird regions, all right? So for example, if you're trying to minimize this function, maybe I can set up a reference point here and I can tell the, the solver, you know what? Do not move too far from this reference point. Do not move too far from it. And I can penalize how far I let the solver to go by precisely using this function, okay? So that is another very effective way of conveying information. So you see that the practitioner has different ways of communicating prior knowledge. And this is how our brain actually works, right? It's like you're saying, you know what? Those parameters don't make sense, right? So narrow down the space. The other way of thinking about it is, do not deviate too much from this reference point because I know that more or less the parameters are around that point. Those are fundamentally two different ways of thinking about conveying information to the, to the solver, okay? So it's a very interesting ways of, uh, of, uh, of doing, okay? So I'm gonna stop uh, the first set of slides here because uh, we need to move on to other, uh, to other uh, topics. But I, again, I just want to invite you to check all the slides that I'm providing. More than happy to answer any questions um, after the course, right? We don't have time to go in, in all these topics. So I invite you to check the slides and, and if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email, okay? But let me stop. Let's take a three minute break. Let's actually make it a five minute break just to stop for now. And then we can go into the other topics that we want to uh, cover, okay? So um, so let's stop now. And um, and if you want to go to the bathroom break or something like that, go ahead. And I'm going to be here in case that you want to ask any questions. All right? So let's stop for a second. 
Any questions anyone has? I'm good. So let me now ask you questions. So hi, Cindy. So you're going from Guanajuato? Hi, doctor. Yes, I am studying here in Guanajuato, but I am from Colombia. Oh, very good. Okay, good to meet you. How is the nice course going you, so far? It's pretty nice to me because okay. I want to introduce to machine learning and it's, it's a really, really good uh, fundamental course. Okay, good. So we'll go slowly here. Uh, okay, let me ask also, I see Gerardo here. Hi, Gerardo. How are you, Professor? So are you, are you here in Madison? I am. Very good. I am, I, I'm, I'm a co-worker of Alan's. Very good. So how, uh, what do you think of the content so far? Uh, pretty good. I, I've been exposed to some of this before good. in an optimization class, but it's kind of interesting to see how it relates to yeah. machine learning. Excellent. So yeah, we'll try to keep establishing those connections. Very good. So I see also Natalia. Hi, Natalia, where are you, where are you coming from? Hi, I'm from Mexico City. Very good. Which institution? UNAM. UNAM, very good. How's the course going so far, Natalia? Yeah, I think also, as others say, it's good. Um, okay. So, I keep. Excellent. Very good. Uh, all right. So I see also Fernando. Hi, Fernando. Where are you coming from? Hey, everyone. I'm from Querétaro. I'm from Mexico. Very good. So uh, which institution are you in? Uh, right now, I'm in uh, an institute. It's called uh, Blue Marble Space. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm there working with uh, some other guys uh, about some radiation topics about the space and shielding and some cool stuff. <laughs> so yeah. How's the course going so far? Do you have some basic experience with some of these topics? Yeah, actually, in the career, I have some like um, approach to these topics, but not especially with this machine learning. I want to, I want to know, I'm a, a, I want to know more about these these topics. So it's pretty good. It's pretty good approach. Great. So, all right, we'll keep uh, chatting, and we have one hour left, and and I have a lot of material to cover, but I'm gonna have to skip some things. But uh, that's great. Okay, let's give it uh, probably one or two more minutes. In the meantime, let's see here. Rafael Mendoza, where are you coming from, Rafael? Or where are you logging in from, I guess? Probably it's not at his desk. Hey, Ale Diaz, are you there? Can I see them? Okay, in left right. Mario, are you there? Mario Rosas? Yes, hi, Professor Zavala. Where are you coming from, Mario? Uh, Unam. Unam? In, yes. I see, yeah, I see here in your comments. So uh, you're in Bachelor in Technology, right? So that's good. Yes, yes, I'm currently finishing my bachelor. Okay. All right. Great, and I see Ale Diaz, it says from Ensenada. That's great, cool. All right, so let's continue the discussion because um, I have a little time. So I'm really gonna give you a very broad overview of some additional mathematical techniques. And I really just wanna jump straight into machine learning because I think that that is really the topic that everyone is interested in, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a super quick overview of the other topics that you're gonna find in the slides, right? The other topic that is very important that I, I think is fundamental in, in a lot of these machine learning tools is uh, linear algebra, okay? So as you already saw these matrices of the data, the Hessian matrix, um, uh, the input matrix, are, are quantities that are very important because they are the ones that contain all the information. Right, that, that we're playing around with. So in terms of linear algebra, uh, one 
key topic that arises in data science is principal component analysis, okay? So in principal component analysis, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the dimension of very high dimensional data. So when you are interrogating a system and you have uh, many variables that explain that system, uh, it's very hard to make sense of all that data, right? So typically what you do is you want to reduce it in some meaningful way, okay? And principal component analysis allows you to do that. And what I want to show you is that exactly the same analysis that we did with the Hessian the, through the eigenvalues is exactly the same thing that you're going to do, okay? And I'm just going to cut to the chase in, uh, in trying to do that, right? But the fundamental idea is the following. What I'm going to do is to take my input data matrix that I'm going to call sigma. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, sigma. This matrix is precisely my matrix X transpose X. And this matrix X is the matrix of input data, right? That we saw before. So this is interesting because this matrix X transpose X keeps appearing over and over and over again. Remember that this matrix X is the matrix that contains all my variables of interest for all the observations, right? And it keeps appearing in this form, okay? Now, you can explain this matrix through the eigenvalues in the same way that we did it with the Hessian matrix, okay? But there's something interesting here. You might remember from your linear algebra course, right? that a given matrix, in this case, I'm gonna call it sigma, that has dimension N by N, has exactly N eigenvalues, right? So I have precisely lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda N. And associated with each one of those eigenvalues, I have an eigenvector, and that is precisely a vector. Those vectors are W1, W2, Wn. And a very interesting result from linear algebra is that I can actually decompose this matrix as a summation of these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. First summation, second summation, and summation. So this observation is fundamental because these eigenvalues that I'm seeing over here towards the end are eigenvalues that tend to be very small in quantity. And these eigenvalues that I have here tend to be very large. So what does that tell me? It tells me that I can actually eliminate most of the eigenvalues without fundamentally affecting the content, the information content of my matrix sigma. And that is very important because this is telling me as long as I know these eigenvectors and these eigenvectors, I can actually get a very good guess about what is my data. And this is the principle for reducing data. Just eliminate eigenvalues that have very small value. Just think about it. If an eigenvalue is zero, you can just discard it, right? Because it's not really contributing anything to this uh, matrix, okay? And that is precisely the role that eigenvalues play in principal component analysis. And I just want to show you a quick example about that. All right. So in mind that you have um, a reactor. So I'm a chemical engineer. So I think about reactors quite a bit. Right. And, and I can interrogate uh, this reactor. And typically, the reactor is affected by variables like pressure and temperature. Right. And then I'm interested in monitoring another variable like the conversion of my reactant. Right. Now, these are three variables that I have to monitor simultaneously, right? And if I wanna monitor them simultaneously, that means that I have to con construct a three-dimensional plot of this data, right? And then you're gonna see all those dots over here, right? Visualizing data in three dimensions is actually very hard. And now in mind that I add another variable here. So for example, the concentration of another reactant, right? Let me just put a C2. So that means that now I have to build a four-dimensional plot. 
And I don't think that we know how to visualize four dimensions, right? Only Einstein can do that probably, right? It's a very hard thing to do. And now in mind that you have five dimensions, right? So it is impossible, right, to visualize that anymore, all right? This is where principal component analysis becomes very useful because what we do is we're gonna construct our database through these matrices X transpose X that are going to contain all my data for pressure, temperature, and conversion. And then what I'm gonna do is to decompose it in these eigenvalues, right? And that is going to allow, and I'm gonna discard the eigenvalues that are really not meaningful. And that is gonna allow me to reduce this to, for example, two dimensions, right? And those two dimensions will allow me to facilitate the visualization, right? In this example, for example, this is my three-dimensional plot, right? And in this case, it's very obvious that there's a clear two clusters being formed in there, right? This is my temperature, pressure, and conversion, right? Now, in mind that you wanted to visualize the data in two dimensions as opposed to three dimensions, right? So what I do precisely is I form my matrix X transpose X, do my eigenvalues. I only preserve the first two eigenvalues and I project the data based on those two base eigenvalues. And you can look at all the details in the slides. So how do you do that, right? I don't have time to go over that. And turns out that if you do that, you can visualize this data in two dimensions here. Now, these variables T1 and T2 that you have here are variables that do not have physical meaning. These are not temperatures, right? This is what people call principal components. Well, these principal components are variables that contain all the information about my original data, right? And you can clearly see that when I do the projection in these two dimensions, I can still perceive these two clusters of interest, all right? So this reduction actually preserves a lot of the information on your data available, okay? Very powerful technique. The key take home message for you is eigenvalues and eigenvectors, again, come to the rescue here, right? These are the key quantities that you really need to understand what are their meanings and why is it important to keep track of them, all right? I'm gonna skip it this part. The other technique that you're gonna see quite a bit in machine learning and data science, and I can almost guarantee that if you dominate this topic, you're actually gonna be very marketable in industry. I can tell you this, right? Um, is singular value decomposition. Okay, I want you to think singular value decomposition as a generalization of the eigenvalue decomposition that we just saw. Just to remind you, what we just did in principal component analysis was to decompose my matrix into this sequence of lambda one, W one, plus blah, 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 lambda n, W n, W n transpose, okay? Very simple, right? That's all that we did. And you can do that in MATLAB, right? You can just compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors from MATLAB for that matrix. That's it, right? Okay, what is the problem? If you remember from linear algebra, this only works when the matrix is a square. In this case, n times n. If the matrix is n times n, where m is different than n, eigenvalues do not exist, right? Eigenvalues do not exist for a rectangular matrix. They only exist for a square matrix. So that means that if you wanna do this type of decomposition for a rectangular matrix, you need to use a different approach. And this is where SVD comes in, singular value decomposition, right? And this can be used for rectangular matrices. This type of technique is very powerful because it's a generalization of eigenvalue decomposition, and because it allows you to process complex sources of data that comes in, in rectangular matrices, things like images, right? So what I'm gonna discuss next is I wanna remind you that an image, a picture, a photograph, is actually a matrix, right? It's gonna be a matrix like this. 
And therefore, I can actually decompose that matrix in its fundamental eigenvalues. I'm going to show you how to do that. And I'm going to show you that those different eigenvalues carry different type of information about the image. OK, so let's look into that. I'm not going to go into the details because all that I want to tell you is this. Singular value decomposition is going to give me a decomposition that is very similar to the one that we already discussed. This is a summation of terms. So it is S1, U1, E1, plus S2, U2, V2, plus Sn, Un, Vn. So this is an expansion, very, very similar to what we did before. But you notice that these vectors are no longer the same ones, right? Before we had W1, W1 transpose. Now these are different. But do not worry too much about that. The fundamental observation, again, is that these quantities, which are called singular values, are also arranged in decreasing order. So what that means is that typically these are very small and typically these are very large. So I can do the same trick. I can eliminate anything that is too small and I can just preserve the quantities that are very large. That is the principle for image compression or in general for any matrix compression, right? So if I can express my matrix X as an expansion of that form, I can just preserve the first singular values, the ones that are the biggest, and I can drop all the uh, uh, large ones, okay? So let's look into how do you use that principle. And I'm gonna show you through this example. SVD is just quite a bit in image compression, okay? Every time that you see an image like this, I actually took that picture with my phone. So every time you take a picture with your phone, right, and store it in your phone, what your phone is actually doing is storing a matrix. The resolution of that matrix is precisely given by the number of pixels, right? So if the phone is telling you the resolution of this is 600 by 600, that means that it has a total of that many pixels, right? So you do this multiplication and it will give you this number, right? So that means that the matrix has this many entries. The number of dimensions here is 600, number of dimensions here is 600. And when I multiply, I get these many entries, right? So this is why it's almost impossible, right? To see the matrix itself, right? Because it is super high resolution, right? Now, the entries of that matrix are encoding the intensity of the light, okay? So if you see a dark spot, that's gonna have a certain large value. If you see a white spot, it's gonna have a very small value. But fundamentally, this is a matrix. So I want you to think about it like this. It's gonna look like something like that, right? Any place that has a large number is gonna appear dark. Any place that has a small number is gonna appear uh, white, for example. And there's a spectrum here, okay? But fundamentally, that's how it looks like. And then you say, well, if this image is a matrix, what would happen if I decompose it, right? And then what would happen if I systematically start eliminating these singular values? Let's see what happens, right? And this is what you're gonna observe. This is the first component of the expansion, okay? You see that the first component of that expansion really doesn't tell you much about the image, right? This is what people call the background. This is just the pure background of the image, okay? Here, I am preserving the first three largest. So I have S1, U1, D1 transpose, so S2, U2, D2 transpose, so S3, U3, D2 transpose, right? And you see that you start revealing some of the features of the image, all right? 
Now let me do 10, right? So here I'm doing 10 elements of that, the first 10 elements. And you see that now that it starts looking closer and closer to the figure, right? And then when I do 100, you see that now the image is almost the same as the original image, right? Why is this important? Because the number of dimensions that I have to store for the original matrix is 605. But what this is telling me is that really the only dimensions that you need to store is 100. Everything else seems to be redundant. This is the secret behind image compression. Every time that you take a picture with your phone, the first thing that your phone is gonna do is compress the image. It's gonna do a decomposition of this form to throw away any resolution that you don't want. Or for example, if, if your phone might actually store the image in high resolution, but then it might ask you, you know what, do you wanna keep a low resolution image to send it to your friends in WhatsApp? Then if you do that, it's gonna compress it. And it's gonna compress it precisely using techniques like SVD. Okay, so it is a really powerful technique for compressing data. Okay, very, very powerful. And again, these singular values, eigenvalues are a very important quantity to keep track of this. All right, any questions up to here? Everything looks good? I hope that at least you're getting the idea. Gerardo is saying, how do you decide what threshold to pick to discard the small values of SVD? Excellent question. Typically what people do is uh, they plot the amount of information that is contained in these singular values, okay? And typically you're gonna get a curve like this, right? And typically you pick a threshold point where the relative improvement of preserving more and more is really has decay. You are seeing diminishing returns, okay? So that's typically when it saturates, okay? Now, there are certain images that do not look like this, right? Certain images actually look more like that. And that is the hard one because you really don't see diminishing returns anymore, right? So it is harder to tell when you can compress it. So there are certain types of images, certain types of matrices um, cannot be compressed further. Or the way to think about it is if I compress it, I'm losing a lot of information, okay? So, so it is dangerous to to compress them anymore, right? So in mind, for example, think about that your original image was this as opposed to this, right? And you say, I wanna compress this one further. Well, what this is telling you is like, you know what? If you compress it further, you're gonna start losing fundamental information. Does that answer your question, Gerardo? So more or less people keep track of how much information is present in the image, right? Okay, great. Hope that answered your question. Perfect, all righty. Let me jump straight into uh, the part four, which is machine learning. And I'm gonna, uh, you're gonna be able to establish the connection with the third part of the course. It's not too difficult, okay? But let's go directly into machine learning here. All right. The, one of the first things that you wanna do with machine learning um, that is a typical model that people explore are called classification models. So give me one second. Classification models look very similar to the nonlinear models that we have already explored. Very, very similar. The only difference is that the output variable can only take discrete values. So for example, zero or one. What type of applications you find for classification? If you wanna predict if a chemical is toxic or not, for example, you say, I'm gonna collect data for that chemical and I wanna predict based on that data if the chemical is toxic or not toxic. And for example, the zero can represent toxic and this one can say non-toxic, all right? So that is the difference with this model. Right? that the output now is discrete, is not continuous. In the previous models that we discussed, we assumed that the output was continuous. 
that means that it can take any value, right? Of interest. It could be zero, minus one, 1, 1.1, 2.1, right? Now, why is this important? Because if you actually have um, discrete behavior, there are interesting things that you can do. And also this is important because this forms the basis of neural nets. When the brain is actually making decisions is based on zero one type of logic, okay? Or that's at least one way that uh, people try to approximate that, okay? And we're gonna look in a little bit into that in a second, okay? But the idea here is that now we have this binary zero one logic and there are specific types of models that allowed you to capture that. One of those models is called the logistic function, all right? So this function G of interest, we can capture it at this logistic function. This is a really interesting function. So it is one over one plus exponential of this minus theta transpose X, okay? This theta transpose X term here, is nothing but this linear combination of your input variables, similar to what we saw with the linear model, right? These are my input variables X, and these are my parameters that I need to learn from the data, okay? So I need to solve an optimization problem again to solve those parameters, right? But fundamentally, that's what those parameters are, okay? This summation is what in machine learning people call evidence, okay? So if I'm gonna make a decision to go zero or to go one, do I have evidence to make that call, right? To make that decision. When this evidence is large and positive, turns out that this function starts converting to one, okay? That means that I have large evidence. When this value goes to negative, and it can actually go negative, this function starts going to zero. And people say that I have a small evidence, okay? When this evidence is exactly zero, right? This function actually becomes one half. And this is when people say I have no evidence, okay? Now, I want you to think about um, the same way, I'm sorry, the same way that you, um, I made a mistake here in sharing my screen, I apologize. I want you to think the same way that your brain works, right? If I'm presented with a large amount of evidence, I'm gonna decide that this person is guilty or that this is gonna happen, right? If I don't have good evidence, I'm gonna go with the fact that it is not guilty, right? Think about that as being your zero. And now if I have no evidence, right? That means that I cannot make a call. I can go either way. That's why I'm one half, right? It's like, okay, maybe he's guilty, maybe he's not guilty, right? I have no evidence to make that call. This is exactly the type of logic that these type of models are trying to mimic. They're trying to mimic how we actually think, how we actually make decisions in the, in the, in the real world, okay? All right, and this is how the, the, this, this function looks like. All right, so similar to what we covered before, if you wanna estimate the parameters that best explain your data, you need to solve an optimization problem. The optimization problem that you solve in this case looks slightly different, or not slightly, it looks different than the ones that we have solved because the output is discrete, okay? That difference is what makes the optimization problem look different, okay? But fundamentally, it's a similar idea. If I wanna estimate the parameters, right, that best explain my observed data, right? I need to solve an optimization problem. And now once you know this, then you can apply your first derivative, your second derivative, the Hessian again will appear, right? And then you can start asking questions. Are those parameters unique? 
Are those parameters not unique? Am I sitting at a minimum point or at a flat point? You can answer all those questions, right? You can ask yourself those questions. Now, what is interesting is that in the machine learning literature, those type of concepts are not discussed. I still don't know why, right? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop asking them, right? So I think when you are solving an optimization problem, always ask yourself, how does the Hessian look like, right? Does this have positive eigenvalues? Does it have zero eigenvalues? Are my parameters unique? You can ask, ask all those questions, right? And then you can start making sense of your model, right? Okay. What types of applications classification models are used for? They are used for everything. There are many applications, right? One thing that, for example, is applied in industry is to identify when something is failing, right? So for example, you collect input data for a reactor, let's say, right? And then based on that input data, I can predict if my reactor is operating normally or if it's actually in failure mode, right? Or if, uh, if I'm about to see an explosion or if I'm not about to see an explosion. Classification models are also used by banks. So for example, when a bank sees your credit score and they see other types of information about you, they can make a prediction if you are gonna pay back your uh, um, any loans that they give you. That is the typical example that places in Google have considered, for example, right? So those are classification models. They say, based on what we know about this person, we can predict that it is very likely that they're gonna pay the loan or they're not gonna pay the loan. And based on that, they might give you the loan or not, all right? So just to give you an idea of the different types of things that people are using it for, the places like the EPA, they will also say, you know what, um, based on these features of this chemical, based on this information we have about this chemical, can I predict if this causes cancer or not, right? And, and, they, and they use that to screen different types of chemicals, right? So just to give you some ideas on, on potential applications. All right, now let's move on. Another type of model that appears quite a bit in machine learning are something that I call kernel models. These models are fascinating, very interesting models that have very surprising properties, okay? Turns out that one of the properties of these models is that they typically require very few param parameters, or sometimes not even less, probably less than five, right? So very, very small parameters. However, they can still capture highly complex nonlinearities, okay? The most popular kernel model that I am aware of is something that people call a Gaussian process model. People, you're also gonna see it that people call it creeping, right? That is a type of a kernel model, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is spend the last 10 minutes explaining to you why is it that these kernel models are so powerful? All right, and it's very intriguing. It's one of those things that I still even trying to convince myself, right, that I actually understand why that is the case, all right? So let me just give you a kind of a quick justification into why these techniques actually work, all right? So I want you to mind for a second that you're building a model of this form. I have a linear combination of parameters times a set of nonlinear functions that people call basis functions, okay? These are my basis functions. These basis functions can be anything you want, whatever you want. Can be a polynomial of any order, can be sigmoidal function, like the one that I just showed you in classification, can be a logarithmic function, could be an exponential, anything you want, doesn't matter, okay? And why is this important? Because you say, you know what? If I have a nonlinear model and I really have no idea how this model looks like, then how about I just create a mixture of all these different functions and let's see what combination of those functions actually best explain the data, right? 
So that combination of functions is actually my model, right? It's precisely that function G that we are seeing, all right? So that is interesting, right? And now the parameters of this model are actually these mixing coefficients. So these are the ones that are telling you how much do you pay attention to this basis function compared to this other basis function? But fundamentally, I'm just creating a mixture of these basis functions. What I'm gonna show you a little bit later is that neural nets, you can think about them as a combination of basis functions. And that's why they're so powerful, right? But we'll look into that in a second. All right, so what we're gonna do is precisely solve an optimization problem, like the same way that we've been doing to actually estimate the parameters of this, right? We're gonna go back into the original optimization problem that we saw before, right? Because we're gonna assume that the output is continuous, right? Same as before. Okay, now what I want to convince you now is that the solution of this optimization problem will actually give me something that does not depend on the parameters theta. Turns out that the parameters theta will become irrelevant. And this is one of the most surprising results, I, I think, in, in statistics and machine learning, if you want to call it that way. Okay. So what I'm going to do is precisely minimize this function and I'm going to minimize this penalty term. This is a regularization term like the one that I was telling you before, right? This is a way of conveying prior knowledge. This is just trying to control the fact that these parameters cannot be too far away from zero, right? Do not worry about the details too much. Okay, I'm gonna step, jump all the details, right? But what I wanna show you is that eventually the optimization problem that you need to solve is this. You want to minimize this SSE function. I'm calling it here the S function. And what you see in this right hand side is that this function actually does not depend on the parameters at all. Nowhere in there, I actually see theta, right? And this is important. How do I arrive to this result? Do not worry too much about it. Just believe me. If you want to see the derivation, it is there. But what is important, the take home message is that this optimization problem turns out that it only depends on this variable R. This variable R is just the mismatch error is here between my model and my data. That's all that it is. All right, and that is an implicit function of theta, but do not worry about that. It's irrelevant for the conversation, okay? And it also depends on this matrix K. And this matrix K is this matrix over here that contains all my input data. This matrix is very analogous, or it is analogous to the matrix X transpose X that I showed you before. But in this case, we are doing a nonlinear transformation of my input data, right? Like this. So this is why it's not actually X transpose X. It's actually something uh, slightly different, okay? You can think about this as a nonlinear transformation of your data, but I'm not gonna get into that because I wanna get you confused. Okay, so if this optimization problem does not depend on theta, Turns out then that I can solve this optimization problem by actually optimizing with respect with this variable R directly. And then I can recover the parameters from this optimal value. So the first thing that I do is estimate my mismatch error from there. And once I have that, I can estimate my parameters of interest. Okay. But the fundamental question is, well, these parameters do not seem to be playing a role, so why do I even care, right? And this becomes even more interesting because when you actually want to make a prediction with your model, right? You're gonna do something like this. This is my basis functions, and these are my estimated parameters. And I can actually see that this quantity is precisely this quantity, 
right? And I can show that this quantity is actually nothing but this, all this quantity. So you see that at the end of the day, the, the predictions of my model, these are my model predictions, do not depend on my parameters theta. And that is quite surprising. My predictions only depend on my output data and on my input data. And that is surprising. It's like those parameters, what that's telling me is that those parameters are really just intermediary variables. But fundamentally, we actually don't need them. It's like when you produce an intermediary product to get to a final product, but you're really not interested in the intermediary product, right? So it is the same concept, right? So I'm producing something that is intermediary, but that I really don't need it at the end of the day, right? So that is one of the most interesting results, I would say, of statistics. But what that means is that the most important quantity that is appearing here is this matrix K. And remember that this matrix K, it is this theta transpose theta, okay? And this is capturing precisely relationships between my input variables, okay? Turns out that this kernel matrix um, is a fundamental object. And this is what gives rise to the name of kernel models. This is the object that is capturing the interaction of my input variables. And I can build this matrix in different forms, right? This matrix can be formed by using a kernel, something that people call a kernel function that precisely is capturing the interaction between my input and observation I and my input and observation J, okay? This kernel function can capture a wide range of behavior, okay? One of those kernel functions that is the most widely used in machine learning, and I want you to go explore this after the course, it is this radial basis function. This radial basis function is just capturing the difference between two observations of my input data, how far apart they are. Are they close? Are they, uh, are they close or are they far apart? Okay. And that's all that it does, right? And the only parameter that it requires is this parameter gamma. And there are some kernel functions that have more parameters, but in this case, I'm just showing you one that only has one parameter, okay? So it turns out that this simple kernel function is sufficient to actually capture a wide range of nonlinear behavior that you have in, a, in, in many different applications. Why is that the case? And again, don't worry if you don't follow the details, just follow the take home message, right? This very innocent looking function, which is an exponential function, can actually be expressed in this form, right? And you see clearly here that this capture the interaction between Xi and Xj. It is capturing the interaction between my observation I and my observation J, right? And this is important. This is what gives rise to nonlinear behavior. Okay, and turns out that this little term over here is actually a polynomial function of actually a very high order that I'm not gonna go into too much detail, right? But you can actually show that this very simple function, actually you can think about it as an expansion of many polynomials, or polynomials actually of arbitrarily high order, right? And that is what explains uh, why this kernel function can capture highly nonlinear behavior, okay? This is one of the most powerful results I'm gonna say in machine learning, okay? Now, why is, the, the, why is this important, right? So turns out that because we have discovered that these parameters are actually not needed, these parameters that are not needed. So we actually don't need to form any model that contains those parameters, right? Instead, what you do in a, in a method, like a kernel method, is propose this uh, kernel function, right? 
And typically that kernel function has very few parameters, typically less than five. And turns out that if you propose a kernel function, then you can construct this K matrix. And once you have the K matrix, then you can make predictions, right? And that's all that you really need. You really never need to propose a model. And that's again, very interesting. And this allows you to capture very complex nonlinear behavior. <clears throat> In this example, what I'm showing you is that I can actually approximate then this nonlinear behavior between an output and a set of inputs, right? This is a very nonlinear function. Um, I can actually approximate exactly the same behavior by using this kernel function, right? And this is a very simple function, right? And you see that the match between my model and my data is super, super good, right? So again, these kind of functions are very, very powerful. All right. Now, Kriegin models, or something that people also call Gaussian process models, are actually kernel models, all right? They are kernel models look very similar to what we just discussed. I don't have much time to go into the details, but fundamentally are models that are trying to um, just make predictions out of input data. You do not need to specify any parameters at all, right? So the model actually looks something like that. Nowhere in there you're gonna see a theta value. That's it, right? All that you need to do is to express the kernel function. That's all that really matters, okay? And the technique will allow you pre to precisely make predictions directly using this kernel matrix, right? And it's super, super powerful. There are many, many things that you can do with this, okay? I'm gonna skip the details because uh, I don't have much time, but uh, you're gonna see in the examples that these are very, very powerful approaches to capture nonlinear behavior, okay? All right, so let's cut to the chase because I know that some of you are very interested in this topic, which is uh, neural nets, right? <clears throat> and with that, we'll conclude the two hour course that we have. So hopefully you're still awake, right? Um, neural nets, they're everywhere nowadays. I still remember when I was an undergrad and this is a long time ago, but still, when I was around 2010, 2001, I remember a friend of mine telling me, you know what, these neural nets seem very interesting. And back in the day, I was like, I don't know if this makes sense or not. And it's amazing how since then in 20 years, this thing has exploded, right? This is everywhere, right? So what are neural nets? What I wanna show you is that neural nets are nothing but this. It is a parametric model, right? that takes input variables, has parameters. So this is not a kernel type of model, right? But you can view it that way, I'll show you in a second. Um, but the key difference is in the way that we express this model G. It's a very specific way in, in which we're gonna do it, okay? Now, neural nets are trying to mimic how humans learn. Now, when we say learn in the context of machine learning, we really mean estimate these parameters, right? We want to estimate those parameters. So that means that we need to solve an optimization problem. Similar to how we did it in the linear and nonlinear models. We need to solve an optimization problem. That's how mathematically what it means to learn something, okay? And also we're trying to understand how do humans form connections inside the brain, right? To actually make predictions, right? Now, some of you, I believe that Andres is an expert in, in uh, probably neuroscience, so I don't want to embarrass myself in how do I talk about this, but it's very rudimentary. I have no knowledge in neuroscience, right, or in brain science, okay? But the, the way that I typically think about it is these neural nets are trying to mimic how the brain actually makes decisions. And the brain, you can think about it as a network of neurons. And, and this, oh, there you go. Andres is also not excellent, good. Um, the brain is a network of neurons and these neurons are decision-making units. And what I wanna show you is that these neurons have zero one logic, or you can at least approximate it that way, right? Just to make a, a sense of it, right? 
And if you model it like a zero one logic, it means that it looks a lot like a classification model. But the difference is that you can actually construct them in interesting ways so that it's not only classification, but you can also make other types of predictions, okay? These neural nets are amazingly flexible. They're gonna be arbitrarily complex. You can build a very sophisticated network and this explains why humans are remarkably good at learning, at absorb lots of information. This network will contain lots and lots of decision-making units, neurons, but also lots and lots of parameters. And that's going to be dangerous. We're going to see that in a second. And that's the fundamental problem with neural nets. You can think about it as a benefit from a human perspective, but as a course from a mathematical perspective. And I'm going to show you why, all right? But fundamentally, I want you to think about neural nets just like the same way that we discovered before, right? It's a nonlinear estimation problem. Um, what we're going to do is to try to model um, the decisions that these neural nets are building by using a binary logic, okay? So I want you to think, and um, before I go into that, I want you to think of a neuron in this form. This is how the neuron looks like to a neuroscientist. And this is how a mathematician or a computer scientist is trying to actually mathematically model it, all right? So what this is doing is saying, I'm gonna take a set of input signals and I'm gonna mix them to these parameters. In this case, think about theta. I'm gonna construct a linear combination of that and I'm gonna make a binary decision based on that. So you can think about the neuron, what it's doing is it's taking evidence, it's taking, it's taking this input data and it's making a decision based on that input data. That can be modeled using the same function that we saw in classification. No surprises there, right? This is why it's so important to learn all these fundamentals because what you're gonna realize is that all these sophisticated techniques that we see in machine learning, fundamentally they're always using the same basic principles, right? So we're trying to approximate this binary logic of the neuron using a sigmoidal function, right? All right. Now, but the important thing is that this neuron actually doesn't live in isolation. This neuron actually is a collection of different neurons. And each one of those neurons can make their own decisions based on the data that is being presented. So think about it like some neurons process visual information, some neurons process sensor um, uh, tact information, right? Or, sen or other sensor information. And each one of them are making their own decisions, right? Asynchronously. And then those decisions can actually be fed to other neurons, right? And that's what we're seeing here. And then these neurons are gonna build more decisions, right? And those decisions can be fed to other layers, right? And you can actually have an arbitrary number of layers. And eventually you're gonna make a decision, right? So this could be your final decision of interest, okay? This diagram hopefully tells you why neural nets are so flexible. You can build as many neurons as you want here, and you can build as many layers as you want here. And all of that gives you flexibility to capture highly nonlinear behavior and to capture a huge amount of inputs. Just think about all the information that the brain is capturing in real time when you are riding a bicycle. When you are riding your bicycle, right? You're processing visual information, like you're even breathing, right? Like you're doing all these different things. You're collecting a lot of information and, uh, and the brain in real time is making a decision, right? All that information in, is being processed with the neural net, right? The brain, right? To actually make a decision. Should I go faster? Should I go slower? Should I stop, right? And it, all this is happening in real time. This is why this is so powerful. Now, the mathematical principles of this is not that relevant at this point, right? But all that I want to show you is that at the end of the day, you need to solve an optimization problem. And that this model, it is capturing all the complexity of the neural net, all right? But the take home message for you again is, okay, here I go again. I need to solve this optimization problem. 
that best matches my data to my output, I can start ans answering my questions. Are these parameters unique? How does my Hessian matrix looks like? What eigenvalues does it have, right? Um, what else can I, like what are my, what is my uncertainty on this? How much do I trust this, right? The very same questions that we asked, that, that we asked before, you can ask them here as well, right? Now the challenge in neural nets is that these models tend to be much, much bigger and more complicated. So answering these questions is not that easy anymore. But fundamentally, I just don't want you to forget that you can still ask those questions, right? So if the neural net is sufficiently not that complicated, right? Then you might be able to still do it, right? But if it's too complicated, you might not be able to do it. Right, so let me just move on. One interpretation of neural nets that people in machine learning are exploring right now is that you can actually interpret it as a mixture of basis functions. Because this is really what it is, right? Let's just go back to this diagram. This is a mixture of basis function, right? And then this mixture is actually getting propagated through other mixtures, through other mixtures. But it is really just a mixture of basis functions. So that means that there's a connection here with kernel models, right? And actually there's people in the machine learning community that are currently exploring that. And people have actually established connections between neural nets and Gaussian process models because they're precisely interpreting neural nets as basis functions, right? Now, what is the uh, unique characteristic of these basis functions? That the basis functions that you're using in neural nets are only of one kind, right? In the previous example that we discussed, we saw that these basis functions could be polynomials, could be logistic functions, right? Could be many different things. In this case, we're only using either sigmoidal functions or some other function, but we're always using the same one, right? And that gives you some interesting properties that you can use to kind of understand what the neural net is actually doing. But fundamentally, don't forget that a neural net is a kernel model, right? It is just a combination of basis function in some interesting way, all right? So again, one of those interesting things. Okay, the last five minutes of the course before I lose my voice, right, is a uh, convolutional neural nets. And we didn't have much chance to talk about convolutions, but I just wanna give you a take home message here, okay? In the neural nets that we just discussed, the input data that we're feeding to the neural net, I'm just gonna draw it in some way like this, actually comes in the form of vectors. My input data come in the form of vectors, all right? In convolutional neural nets, you can actually process matrices, not only vectors. So I can actually input a matrix, right? And that is interesting because if you can process a matrix, then you can ask yourself the question, oh, wow, this is interesting. So maybe I can fit it images, right? So it turns out that that's precisely the number one application of convolutional neural nets. I can actually fit it an image and have the neural net figure out what that image is or predict a property of that image, right? So for example, in industry right now, one of the things that they're interested in is they wanna take a picture of something like a furnace. And based on that picture, they wanna predict if this furnace is about to fail. They're doing the same in material science. They take a picture of a material and based on that, they wanna predict if this material is about to crack, right? Things like this, they use it for those type of applications. The most popular example that probably you're gonna see in, a, in online, right, is more for image classification. So this is the type of models that Google solves every day, right, when they're trying to classify the images that people upload to Google or to Facebook or things like that, right? So the idea is that they're gonna feed 
precisely my matrix, which we have seen can be a uh, matrix, right? So remember, an image is a matrix, right? And then what the neural net is going to do is going to do a set of operations that we call convolution operations that unfortunately didn't have time to explore, but is discussed in the slides if you want to learn more about that. And all that it is, is that these convolutions are going to extract key features of that image. And these features are going to come here. All right. Those key features now are a vector, right? So this is a little x as opposed to a big x. So that means that if this is a little vector, right, or a vector, then I can feed it to a typical neural net, right? And this is typically what people do, just feed it to a typical neural net. And then finally, you can predict if this is a bicycle, or if this is a car or a truck or a van, right? But the fundamental difference with convolutional neural nets is that they use these layers here to precisely map this image or this matrix into a set of features that can be fed to a neural net. It is just like trying to identify key features in the image that best explain that image, OK? So it is very basic principle. In the slides, you're going to see everything that is to know. And I just want to conclude by telling you this. If you want to learn the parameters of a convolutional neural net, you're going to need to solve an optimization problem. And then you start asking yourself the question, how do I solve that problem? And what I can tell you is that the optimization problem that you solve in a convolutional neural net is one of the most complex optimization problems that I'm actually aware of. But surprisingly, nowadays, there are very efficient tools uh, for doing all of these tools, OK? So with that, I'm going to conclude the course, right? I know that it's a very quick and very uh, simple kind of discussion, right? So we cover a lot of material very quickly. But hopefully, I was able to at least convey the message that um, there are basic mathematical principles that, that um, explain all these machine learning tools that you're seeing around. I want you to always remember that those principles come from statistics, linear algebra, optimization, right? And that those little things, if you actually know them and master them, you will actually be able to understand quite a bit of machine learning because machine learning is really just tools that are actually derived out of those basic principles, okay? So let me stop here. If you have any questions, you can ask them now. And, and feel free also to shoot me an email if you want to learn more or if you have more questions, okay? Well, let me stop here, Andres, and then maybe leave a couple of minutes for questions. Great. Any questions that you might have? Anything that you feel curious about? Doesn't have to be about the content, could also be about general machine learning perspective, anything that you're interested in. I actually have a question while the someone gets brave enough. Uh, for neural networks that have more complex architectures that we didn't cover here, right? Like yep. recurrent neural networks and, and transformers and yep. all sorts of like attention and, and more complex architectures. Can you still think of parameters? Like, like, you know, when you presented neural networks, you were saying now we, even though it's more complicated, we can still think about the same questions we were asking before. So compute the Hessian, yep. calculate uncertainty. Can you still do that for? those more complex architectures? Yes. As long as the estimation problem involves an optimization problem, if you are going to learn those parameters out of solving an optimization problem, you can ask yourself those questions like, well, what are these parameters? How many do I have? How big is this Hessian? Is this Hessian um, have unique? Uh, if the parameters are unique and things like that, you can ask those questions. As long as the learning process can be expressed as an optimization problem. Right? And, and those are questions that are interesting that I haven't seen being addressed, right? Um, like there's some, there's some basic work on neural nets and trying to compute Hessians for it. It's not easy. But for example, computing Hessians for a convolutional neural net is actually very complicated. Computing Hessian for an order encoder as well, I expect it to be quite complicated. But again, you can ask yourself the question and see if that leads you to some interesting insight. So great. Thank you for the question, Anders. So uh, uh, Gerardo is asking, why are kernel methods no more commonplace? So actually, they are used quite a bit. Kernel methods are used a lot, right? 
Um, compared to neural nets, right? Um, I would say that neural nets are probably now more prominent because they tend to be more flexible, more powerful. But the problem with neural nets is that it's very hard to get a statistical um, interpretations of the prediction. So for example, you wanna quantify the uncertainty of your parameters or quantify the uncertainty of your predictions. It's not that easy to do with a neural net. While a kernel method can do that, right? Because it comes from statistical principles. But they're actually used quite a bit, Gerardo. Kernel methods are used a lot, right? I would say that they are not as famous, I would say, as neural nets. I think that neural nets are intuitive and that's why people use them. Kernel methods, I think that sometimes people uh, have a hard time understanding why they actually uh, work, right? Because it's kind of a mysterious thing of why this actually thing captures nonlinearity, but they're used quite a bit, okay? So uh, you're gonna hear more about them in the context of Gaussian process models. That, that's how people refer typically to some of them. Okay, great question, Gerardo. So Mario is asking, are convolutional neural nets also useful for video analysis? Excellent, yes. Um, there are generalization of convolutional neural nets that instead of, uh, this is an interesting thing, instead of taking a matrix, now in mind that you take a sequence of images, right? That gives you a three-dimensional matrix that is called a tensor, right? You can also fit tensors to a convolutional neural net, and that allows you to make predictions about video. And, and people do video analysis. So based on a sequence of observations of a movie, they want to predict if something happens, right? That is also used quite a bit uh, to this. If you are interested in learning more about that, Mario, feel free to send me an email and I'll send you a paper that we recently wrote on this topic. So it's, uh, it's quite powerful. I mean, you can use them for, for video as well. So great. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, staying for a couple of hours and listening to me for a couple of hours. So I hope that you learned something useful. And again, we went fast, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to give you more information. So thank you a lot, Victor. Um, I hope to see you again in this event and elsewhere too. And for all the attendees, thank you for, for being here.